This is the Lydian Spin episode number 94 with Lydia Lunch and Tim Doll. That's my name. I didn't forget who you fucking right. were. You slept on my couch last night, goddammit. And then you snuck out without even kissing me on that cheek. Well, I, you told me if you're in Snoozosaurus Rex land. Never just to kind of, just to kind of make, make me my way out. All right. Well, you had a long rehearsal with the flying Lutenbuckers, and then we had a long, long philosophical discussion, which is what we always do when we entertain each other. Yes. Uh, it was yes. A, it was a fabulous event. And then wisely you decided not to chance the possible dangers that may lurk in the streets at four o'clock in the morning. I got some inside info. We don't have to say what it was. That oh, the, no. co the cops were lurking last night. So yeah. And usually I'm the ones <laughs> lurking. For cops, <laughs> you know what? It's funny. They always avoid me. Well, you noticed that, Tim. We've been in the car together, and it's like suddenly, I don't know. They don't. We become invisible. You know, if it wasn't so incriminating, uh, the story, the story, uh, the stories are too good. That's a that, well, and it's funny because good. my first story is about the police. Okay. Michigan police canceled. Yes a PTSD training session with controversial killology. God, I love that name speaker. Huh? Okay. After he tells officers that the best sex happens after you kill someone what? and that taking a life is not a big deal. Retired Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman oh faced God. a fear. Let me continue. I'll just say that again. Retired Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman faced a fierce <laughs> backlash after video surfaced of him telling cops killing is not a big deal and that it will give you the best sex. Now, Grossman has trained wow. military and police officers for decades, and he wrote the bestseller. I'm going to check it out on quote. The, the title is on killing about training regular people. To kill. Isn't there enough of that shit going around? What so the anyway, the, Mi the Michigan Police Association was due to host Grossman to help cops <laughs> overcome PTSD trauma after one recent officer's suicide. By the way, cops do have one of the highest rates of suicide, divorce, alcoholism, and assholism on the planet. Okay. Oh, so, God. <laughs> so anyway, the event was canceled amid heightened focus on police brutality in the wake of the George Floyd killing. And police... Thank you very much for helping us control the population in the U.S. <laughs> kill around a thousand civilians a year, a figure that oh has remained God. stable as violent crime has spiked. Uh, so these are some of his quotes. Grossman, that would be quote. I've been on the road for 18 years. People know me. They trust me. I get a depth of information. I ask questions other people won't ask. Cops say <laughs> knock down, drag out, fight. Cuff them and stuff them. Finally get home and at the end of the shift, well, the best sex you've ever had, especially if you just killed someone. Now, there's not a whole lot of perks that come with their job, so you got to find one that you like and relax and enjoy it. Oh, my God. It's Thanks, a, gross man. Yeah, what a, a recruiting... <laughs> a recruiting zone for sadists and um, we'll, we'll we'll get in we'll get into that in a minute so anyway that's uh that's what we're leading off with now okay you I, i'm gonna continue with this please so members of the white supremacist group the base are charged with cutting off a ram's head and drinking its blood in a halloween oh ritual <laughs> halloween ritual sacrifice at a georgia training camp <laughs> while oh they were planning a race war i thought there already was a race war that it is intelligent people against the stupid ones but a race <laughs> race to the bottom if you ask me so five members of the base were charged this month with killing a ram during what authorities have said was a ritual sacrifice at the training camp now three of the members were charged last year okay because what they did was they actually stole the ram from a local property and they tried to kill it with a knife they couldn't, so they just decided to shoot it. So, <laughs> pro prosecutors say the animal was killed in a Norse pagan ritual. Oh, my God. What a uh, dorks. Well, it shed further light on the base, the white supremacist group. And an undercover, an undercover FBI agent who infiltrated the group has previously said that members used the training camp to not only kill animals, but to prepare for that big race war that's coming once again to the oh United boy. States. Well, it's, so, so it's base spelled B-A-S-E or B-A-S-S. -S. <laughs> it's, 
It's called a B-A-S-E, or as I'd like to spell it, B-A-S-T-A-R-D. Okay. That's my training <laughs> camp. Bastard training camp. I'm not even going to tell you what that involves. Go ahead. Please interrupt Yeah, me. yeah. Well, you know, you have to. Cut that's, in. that's a bunch of uh, losers, it sounds like. In the Bavarian forest somewhere, or as they call it, the Bayernwald, the bomb squad was called uh, ah. because, because uh, someone was hiking through and they found a World War II hand grenade, further inspection, and, you know, just a few feet away, there's a bag with lube and condoms. It turns out it was a sex toy that was, it's in the shape of a World War, it's like a rubber thing, it's a hand grenade sex, I don't, I don't know what that is, but. Uh, now that is what I call <laughs> a handy device. I okay. Yeah, so I, I see, you know, these people meet in the forest for their little rendezvous, but um, I, I, what, do, what do you think that goes? It goes into an orifice, like a, a rubber well, hand Jim, grenade? Jim, it's, wherever it fits is where it goes, you know, you, you got, put a little lube on it, it'll probably go anywhere that, depending how aggressive your partner is. Oh, Ray. Right. Okay. It's, it's a fantasy of mutilation of the genitals. I, 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 you know, I'm slow with these uh, things. You know, so, suddenly yeah. I'm thinking that instead of a ball gag in somebody's mouth, a live grenade. I'm, I'm, now, oh. I'm getting, now I'm getting turned on, Timmy. Cut, oh, cut, cut, cut back on that. You're, right, get, right, you're right, getting right, me excited. Right, right, right. Right. I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop. No, you won't. <laughs> I, you're, you're right. I, I, I won't. Karen McBride of Texas was in the process of doing her, renewing her license. I think she got married. She was changing her name. And they to said, McGroom instead of McBride. Yeah, there you go. God, no, nice dad pun. All right. So what happened was uh, they said, well, we can't renew it because there's a warrant out for your arrest. And she's like, what are you talking about? Well, it turns out there's been a warrant for her arrest for 20 years in Oklahoma because she never returned a VHS tape, uh, Sabrina the Teenage Witch in 1999. <laughs> And and the, the thing is, she's now uh, coming to the conclusion because she was employed all the time. And in the last 20 years, she couldn't get a job because they would do a background check. She didn't realize because they found out, they're like, oh, there's a warrant. She's a criminal. We can't hire her. So she was like been living in this like poverty misery. And then Ugh. finally found out it was like a for a 50. It's, they said it was worth fifty four dollars. Like, who would pay fucking fifty four dollars for that? But. OK, uh, well, uh, that I mean, that's a hard <laughs> turn of the screw, if you ask me. Yes, it is. Jesus. All right. Well, this kind of reminded me of you, Tim. Please. A satanic rock found. Mm -hmm. Mysterious boat shaped satanic rock structure is discovered in an Whoa. Icelandic cave that Vikings, that would be your people, likely okay. used to ward off the apocalypse 1100 years ago. So researchers were excavating a cave in Iceland associated with where people would hold rituals to welcome or avoid the end of the world. So Vikings used to go to this cave and make sacrifices. Okay. And they were designed to try to stop the onset of what they referred to as Ragnarok. Ragnarok, the end right. times event. So, so even weird. after even after Christianity took hold in Iceland, the cave was associated with the Judgment Day and thought to be where Satan would return to the earth. Now, ah. so yeah. not only that, what was more interesting even than a <laughs> Satan-shaped rock, rock. <laughs> was that in the cave there were weird elements that must have been they thought from the Middle East, like various gems and and minerals and really they had no idea how they well, got the, their well, vikings the, 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 traveled the, yes yes they went all the way through the the, the mediterranean they went all, i mean vikings hit sicily that's why you have blonde uh you know you have like a blue-eyed uh sicilians like yourself lydia well you know i had a viking or two in me in the past <laughs> well, yeah I, I, I mean i mean the, the, the vikings were yeah i mean i always say they were doing this drunk so, I mean, I mean, could you imagine rowing these long distances? Because, you know, if there's no if there's no drinking water you know, in the middle of the ocean, they're drinking alcohol. And upon arrival, they're murdering, raping, steal. You know, you're, you're drunk and then they're loading up these boats with all this treasures. And that's just exhausting labor. But you're drunk doing it. So pretty impressive. I have I'd, to say. I'd, I'd say absolutely. I, I saw a little special the other day on some guys. It was a crew that decided to build boats the way they used to be with no hammer nails, just tied with rope and actually sailed to from L.A. to Hawaii to Tahiti, then around that way to go to the way that the Philippines had had traversed on these boats. And they survived the journey. 
Well, speaking of Scandinavians, yeah, Tor Heyerdahl. Yeah, that's Contiki, the famous uh, book where, yeah, they went from um, Peru uh, to, to Easter Island. Same thing. Uh, you know, Tim, I'm recalling, I'm, I'm recalling one time when we were on a boat together. Do you remember this? This very a famous only between you and I fairy episode where the wind was so yes! strong. It was so fantastic. You and I were the only two that would go out there. Um, it was so violent. It was so beautiful. Yes, I love the I, I wind. Think, I think I have <laughs> a video of that. It was one of these things like we, we went out there. I, I assume this was uh, Calais to Dover, but it could have been it could have been in Scandinavia. I, I don't know. But I can't remember. Uh, but, remember matter, but, but we were kind of we were kind of like leaning into it. You know, we were kind of at our angle, oh. like like we weren't falling for it because the thing was just so insane. That's fun. No, 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 uh, the wind is w- the wind is one of my favorite elements. I mean, I just love the wind. To me, it's so mysterious. Where the hell does it come from? It's so mysterious. It can be so strong, so damaging, so deadly, or so fragrant. I mean, it's kind of the way I feel about myself. Have you, have you ever been in an extreme windstorm? Like, uh, well, well, I mean, I lived hurricanes. in New Orleans for two oh, years. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hello. Big time. Big time. Hello. Have, you ever been, have you ever been sailing? Have you ever been sailing? I've been shark. Sailing, shark sailing. What? Well, no, <laughs> no, I've been sailing. I've been sailing off the coast of Florida. Yes, in a oh, cool. sexy sundress, where other people were like, you know, was trying to catch sharks. I don't know why. I mean, you know, me. I always want to ride the shark. Funny. I'm gonna move on to tragedy. Um, Taylor Kale. She was. Tw- she didn't even reached thirty. She was twenty nine. She asked some guys she liked on a date to celebrate her birthday, go on wine tasting. She, she's on her way walking, and suddenly she was struck by a falling man. A oh, guy, a, a guy. I heard about this. Awful, yes, committed, awful. Committed suicide. He jumped like 11 stories up and just landed on her. And her the date was like, I get, well, I guess it's over. <laughs> I mean, like, and they, they both died. I mean, God. You know, I mean, I, I, I can understand that sometimes some people just feel they can't take another, mo- I don't know why, another moment of this life. I feel I can never get enough of it and might want to take themselves out. But I really have a problem with people taking other people out in the meantime or just accidentally taking them out is even worse. Yeah, that was a bummer. So going going back to F- Florida, you're talking about shark sailing in Florida. Um, <laughs> they just, uh, Palm Beach, someone stumbled across 65 pounds of bricked cocaine worth 1.5 million dollars on the beach you know because they dump them all the time for- never in florida at the right time are we <laughs> right. it turns out this is the second time this happened this year a, a, a snorkeler in the keys in march found 68 pounds of uh brick cocaine you know when i was a kid once i was in florida with my brother dad and uncle and I, I, I think I had like a mask and snorkel or something. I lost something in the beach. And so we, we were I was looking for it. And my father helped. We were kind of shuffling our feet in the sand, see, seeing if we could find the lost snorkel, snorkel mask. And we found something. And I, I, it was like this encased thing. And it was kind of rubber. And my dad, my, my dad's like, I was like, what's this? He's like, I don't know. And he's like, threw it like further away. But in retrospect, as I think about it, I was like, I think that was cocaine. Oh, shit. I think that was coke. Well, okay. you know, not all dads are as smart as they should be. All right, look, <laughs> I got to talk about this for a minute. Toxic honey. No, that's not my Whoa. stripper name. <laughs> uh, well, it could have been. <laughs> look uh, out. The world's nuclear, we know, the world's nuclear powers have detonated more than I unbelievable any of us are still alive 500 nukes into the atmosphere right and just just test you know shows the forest to rival nations uh proof that countries such as the u.s france yeah. russia have mastered the science of the bomb well the world's honey has suffered from it according oh. to a new study published in nature communications honey in the united states is full of fallout Lingering from the atmospheric no nuclear way. test. Yes. Now, there is an, I've got, I've, I've got a positive tale yeah, to this story. Please, please. Well, maybe instead of honey made in the USA, have you ever heard, Jim, about mad honey? I have not. Please well, let educate me, me fill your ears with a little bit of I'm, uh, <laughs> mad honey. I'm so, into it. Mad honey is found on the mountainside of Nepal and Turkey, and bees there produce a strange concoction. It's 
a rare variety of their natural fluids. Now, there are hundreds of other types of honey produced in the world, but mad right. honey is redder, slightly more bitter, and it comes from the world's largest honeybee, which is called the Apis dorsata laboriosa. Now, what distinguishes mad honey from other is its physiological effects. So in lower doses, mad honey causes dizziness, lightheadedness, Whoa. euphoria. Higher doses can cause hallucinations, vomiting, no. loss of consciousness, seizure, and in rare cases, death. Yes, death. Mad honey, toxic wow. honey, mad honey. So the psychoactive effects of mad honey, they don't stem actually from the bees, but from what the bees feed on in certain regions. And they feed on a, a certain variety of rhododendrons. So all species of those plants actually contain a neurotoxin, <laughs> which can cause well, you know, hallucinations, dizziness, tightness in the chest, euphoria, or death. Just saying. In a controlled environment. I mean, can you imbibe? I mean, if you know what you you're doing. You can getting- imbibe, yeah, but you have to like, uh, yeah, half a teaspoon at a time. <laughs> so so if, you, if someone's selling it and, they, they, and they're basically like kind of, you know, present it like, yo, I got mad honey. <laughs> yeah. I prefer it if they have mad money, but look, it's illegal in most countries, but not where it's harvested. So, I mean, I don't think we could import, unlike, you know, Manuka honey, but I don't think we could import mad honey. I think we'd have to, yeah. I'm not going, I'm not going to the mountains to just lick no. a bee's ass. I'm just no. saying, Hey, come on. Well, speaking of the, the whole nuclear <laughs> and whatever toxic honey, it, we're, we're right around the 35th anniversary of the Chernobyl disaster. They brought in tourism. I don't get how to understand how that works. I guess you take iodine pills. It doesn't really interest me that much, but this is the one that always blows my mind um, because there's been a lot of documentaries about it that, that there's been all nature has basically yeah. taken over because no humans are there. So there's wolves that hadn't been there for just for centuries, all types of stuff that's coming back and it's thriving. And, and it always blew my mind. It's like, oh, right. Humans living in an area is actually more vicious and deadly on nature than a fucking nuke going off. <laughs> well, you know, I was in Kiev. I was in Russia and, and Kiev not long after Chernobyl with mm. the group Dehout. And one of the guys, <laughs> Yachin, actually brought a trunk of all the food and water he would have to drink because... Holy it was shit. toxic. Look, at that point, which was before prostrogue, all the food was toxic. So he was the wise one. Anyway, I don't know. You got anything, well, 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 yeah, got Joe, anything I'll, more to add? I'll run with this a little bit because we were talking about the Bayern fall earlier. So yeah, in the Bavarian forest, because there, there's a lot of um, people dig up truffles and, and they also <laughs> hunt wild boar. And when you when you get a hunter water wild boar and you bring to the butcher because they eat it, they have they have to have a toxic test because the mushrooms will harbor in the radioactive stuff you know, for, for mushrooms will forever. So depending on what side of the mountains, because the way the weather was a- acting for like the weeks afterwards and the rain is far south, you know, as far away as, as southern Germany and Bavaria, there's still signs Toxic of tur- yeah, mushrooms. Up. And you don't want to eat. A, yeah, you don't want to eat a radioactive pig. Either. Well, it's funny because I just read an article the other day that said even if you ate only one mushroom, not a radioactive one or a magic one necessarily, even if you ate only one mushroom a day, like a brown mushroom, an oyster mushroom, a beach mushroom version of the oyster or, uh, you know, baby Bella, that one mushroom a day can cut your chance of getting cancer by 45 percent. We got to eat some more mushrooms. Psychedelic mushrooms save some people from their own insanity. They are. No, 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 no. The Pusaka, they, they act differently. You, you have to eat 50 a day. <laughs> <laughs> I dare you. I've seen you on far less, and I was oh. impressed. I must say. Oh. Yeah. You've never, Tim, you've never seen me flying really high on mushrooms because hmm. although it might be I'm an education, well, it might be an education for you because it is like every Betty Davis movie rolled into a three minute trailer for it. I don't think you want to go there. I, I think I do. Well, now, that's a challenge we can take up this weekend when it is your birthday. Oh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> maybe I'll treat you. Maybe I'll treat you to a trailer of Betty Davis films under the influence of oh. Mad Honey and Wild Mushrooms. That sounds saying. sounds like well, my dream <laughs> day. <laughs> well, you're always my dream day. This <laughs> is the Lydia and Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dolly, episode number 94 with I am. I actually have chills before I even mention the name of Dennis Dunaway from the Alice Cooper band who wrote like all the best frickin songs from Alice Cooper. And I 
I remember as a 13 year old, oh my God, when they came on Friday night mm. rock shows, I was, I still, I mean, it, it, what's weird is this has gone on for a while. Every few days, I just have to hear, is it my body by Alice Cooper? I just love those albums until Billion Dollar Babies. I'm so excited. We have Dennis Dunaway, Lydian Spin. This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch, Tim Dahl, and a very special guest, Dr. Dreary. That would be Dennis Dunaway, uh, infamous for writing some of my favorite songs when he was in the Alice Cooper group. Welcome, Dennis. Yes, hello. <laughs> Great to have you. So were you originally a guitar player? Are you like a bass player or just uh, only played the bass? But where did this, why the bass? There's a definite reason why I became the bass player because Alice and I started the band before we even knew what instruments we were going to play. And cool. And I was the last person to choose. So bass was what was left. <laughs> and, and, and it was, I mean, not to jump into some technical stuff too early here, but you did short scales up until... I don't know, many years in. You, is that a Paul McCartney thing or what's going on? No, no, because the first bass that I bought, you know, I didn't have any money. I went up to Oregon to work on my grandfather's farm to get the money to buy my first bass. And, and Glenn Buxton went with me down to Montgomery Ward and, and it was a beginner's bass. So it, was, <laughs> it was really yeah. a kid's bass. And I had long arms and long fingers at the time, but but still, it was a bass, and I didn't know any different uh, difference at the time. So I used that on Pretty's For You. It's now on display at the Mus Musical Instrument Museum in Phoenix, Arizona, <laughs> which is an amazing museum. Uh, and, okay. then, and then I used a, a Hofner on Easy Action because uh, we had been in an accident, and I didn't have a bass when we were pulled in the studio to record that. And the producer, David Briggs, said, well, go look in that closet over there. There's some equipment in there. See if there's a bass. And there was a bass. It was a Hofner bass that belonged to the cow sills. That's what I used on Easy oh. Action. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's definitely turning the dial in another direction. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, 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 like the kind of semi-hollow body kind of Paul McCartney Hofner, like that, Ex that style? Exactly. You can see pictures okay. of the little kid in the cow sills playing it. <laughs> let's let's start since you mentioned Phoenix, which is where you and uh, Alice went to school together. What were your influences before you started Alice Cooper, like surrealism? Was there any music that inspired you? Because let's face it, pretty revolutionary stuff back then, Dennis. Well, my family is very musical, but it's all country, you know. So <laughs> I grew up as a little kid me trying to stay awake watching my dad and all of our relatives. I had two cousins who were the girls that sang harmony with a country band and one of them married a, a steel guitar player. So I grew up listening to them doing their own homemade honky tonks on Saturday night up in Oregon. And they would play a lot of Bob Wills and uh, Hank Williams and that kind of stuff, you know. By the time I was in high school, you know, the Beach Boys were happening and uh, doo-wop and I loved Elvis and all of that. I remember when I was in grade school, whenever Elvis would put out a new single, my babysitter would come over with their girlfriends in their poodle skirts and they would do the bop. <laughs> to the, and I would be cool. I would be in charge of playing the record. <laughs> we know it's what? we know it's just a short <laughs> jump from Elvis to Alice. <laughs> yeah. So, so were you, were you, you guys were in the country. I mean, were you, was your family, for better or for worse, were you guys Okies? Were you like Dust Bowl, moved out west? Like, what, what are the roots to well, that? Well, you know the movie Grapes of Wrath. Oh, yeah. And the book, of course. Well, yes. okay, that's my dad's family, except... Amazing. My dad, I was right. My dad was born in, uh, in Texas, in Flory, Texas, which blew up. Uh, I mean, it blew away like a tumbleweed at one point. Now their Flory is back again. It's near... What is it? Lubbock is where uh, Buddy yeah. Holly was from. Yeah, it's near there. But he was only born there because his family, with all of the kids, nine kids, had 
driven out there, California and already found out that that was all there. There wasn't the dream work out there. Right. And they were on their way back to Oklahoma. So my dad was born in Texas, oh, but he always considered himself a, an Oklahoman an Okie. Right. You know, okay. uh, it, you're not looking out a window. You're looking out a window. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's, it's like with Merle Haggard, like ending up in uh, Bakersfield or his family, the same same kind of story. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. All of that. And it was my dad only would allow country music on the radio in the house or Western movies on television when we finally got one and in the car. The first record I heard was Johnny Cash. And uh, there's a lot of pathos in country music. There's a lot of heartbreak, drinking, divorce, mistresses, all kinds of dirty deeds going down in country music. Yeah, That's well, I just heard somebody say that now that they're developing a car that drives itself, it's only time until a country song is written where the guy's pickup left him. Ah, ha, 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 that's a good one. So if dad's rule, family rules are um, only country music. What did he say when you start playing with a cross-dressing, glam, hard rocker, undefinable at the time, <laughs> musician? <laughs> band? Well, well, you know, that country mentality was, you know, let the kids learn from themselves, you know, and, and they, they pretty much, you know, if we went out to play, you know, the only time... I heard any criticism as if the neighbors complained about me breaking a window or something like that. But only one time ever, my dad brought me home and set me down and we were the spiders at the VIP club at the time. And we were making like $500 a weekend at the time. And I had just gotten paid and I had pay from previous weekends because I didn't spend much of it. And my dad set me down at the table and said, don't you think it's time to get a real job? And I pulled all the cash out of my pocket and put it on the table. And that's the last thing he ever said to me about it. That's right. Dad. Get, <laughs> get behind me, daddy. So what, what kind of, uh, what kind of art or film? So you're, you're, you're in the country music genre mandated by dad, but what kind of, because Ellis Cooper was, was so classically horror filmic. Were there movies that were inspiring you as a young upstart with a bass? Yeah, absolutely. Alice and I would go to the drive-in together and we would see Psycho and we would see, what was it? Trilogy of Terror, I think. No, not Trilogy. It was an Edgar Allan Poe, okay. three, three short movies all put together in one film. Okay. Yeah, and- Telltale Heart and- Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah and, there, yeah, and there's another one. You, uh, you got it. I, I know you're talking about it. Keep on, right, Telltale yes. Heart was the biggie, the memorable but That's the big one. Yeah. It was a grand finale. Yeah, exactly. right. Yeah. Uh, so you, we would go and see things like that and, you know, and we, we loved it, but most, uh, but we also became friends in art class and he was the only one in the school that had any clue who Salvador Dali was yeah. and stuff like that. So that was a, <laughs> the, probably the biggest influence on us going kind of the, the uh, theatrical route, but also the very first show that we did at Cortez High School when we could actually play our instruments the first two that we did, we were pretending we could play. Glenn, Bux Glenn Buxton was the only one that could play at the time. And Allison and, and me and, and a, a friend of ours, John Spear, who was the original drummer in the earwigs, we pretended that we were playing and Glenn Buxton actually played. We just sang. But when we could mm -hmm. actually play, we the first gig we had was the Halloween dance. And Alice and I, being the uh -huh. artist, we put giant spider webs built and made out of clothesline, and we made uh, tombstones, and we got refrigerator boxes and made coffins, and and we even uh, had a friend <laughs> whose father was a carpenter, and we got him to build us a guillotine. And even in uh, high okay. school, in high okay. school, uh, yeah, we arts, were... arts and crafts, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and that was so much fun. That kind of really stuck with us, you know? So how long were you in Phoenix developing, shall we say, your craft before? And where did you go after Phoenix? So, okay, the band is forming. You're all starting. You're, you have the concept. You've, you already got the guillotine. <laughs> yeah, even though you can't play your instruments that well. How long were you in Phoenix and where did you go after that? Well, we actually became a pretty big fish in that little pond called Phoenix because 
uh, Alice was still in high school and I was fresh out of high school, Glenn and I, when we got a hit, a hit single, number 11 on AM radio in Tucson, Arizona. Don't blow Amazing. your mind. So we were. What, what, under what title was that? What uh, the group Spiders. Was that? The, the Spiders. Spiders, okay. The, the guy that ran the club, the VIP in Phoenix, he knew all of the disc jockeys and he knew how to promote this club. And he would have every day, all day long, it would be this weekend, the spiders, spiders, <laughs> spiders, you know, and, wow. and don't blow your mind. Don't blow your mind you know? And uh, we would pack this club. It was supposed to hold, I think, 800. And we'd pack in like 900 to 1,000 every night, twice. You're a teenager. A you're, you're, wow. you're barely out of high school. You're packing them in. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, and we did theatrics. So, so that's, that's one way that we drew them in. There were a lot of good bands in Phoenix. Other musicians that were playing that club from time to time were the Tubes. <laughs> oh really? But 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 but, but, that, but they're San Francisco, right? I mean, are, are the two? They might. We migrated to to Hollywood to make it, and they migrated to San Francisco. Oh, I did not know that. Okay. okay. I I, I saw the tubes early on in Buffalo, New York. I, I don't even know how I uh, how I, I convinced my parents. I'm going on the Greyhound bus to go see the tubes. Thirteen, fourteen snowstorm. I end up with two blonde twin boys, not much older parents out of town. It was a great show. <laughs> well, you know, in 2017, the original group joined Alice's band for a European tour, okay. including Wembley. We sold out Wembley and, oh, sure. and the uh, supporting band was the Tubes. And we're backstage <laughs> after all these years from the mid 60s. <laughs> and there's there's eight musicians in that show that were started in Phoenix, Arizona when we were in high school. How ignorant am I? Because I, you know, I've only played Arizona a few times on tours, and, and I always thought, I, when I when I thought of Arizona, I always thought like maybe Tucson was the more artistic town, and Phoenix, I just could never put my finger on it. I, it's so little I know that there was such a vast music. Scene I've there. played Phoenix a few times, and I even had art shows in Phoenix, and that was you know within your lifetime. Yeah, well, uh, you know, it it's changed now. Like yeah. okay. back then, yeah. it was more of an isolated oasis. Right. And, 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 you know, and back in those days, television went off the air at 10 o'clock at night. And while it was on the air, there wasn't much worth watching, you know. Right. And so what else was there to do? It was, the really, it was really good for bands. There's nothing else to do, you know. Right. And, and, and now it's now Phoenix is this what six biggest city in the country. And it's like it's a gazillion times bigger. And it's a do you recognize it? How do people deal with the goddamn heat, though? It's it's unbearable. It's for lizards only. I don't get it. You have to live under a, a gauze of air conditioning nonstop. Some well, well, you know, your your body does climatize if you live there. But yeah, I know my relatives always tell me, you know, when I say, oh, it's 49 degrees today, they say, oh, well, it's 80 here. And I go, get back. I say, get back to me in August. <laughs> well, that's the thing. It's like, it's, it's like Minneapolis and Phoenix are the two cities where people are indoors half the fucking year. Yeah, well, well, it drove us out. We didn't have air conditioning like like. Holy now. shit. So it, they had swamp coolers, which oh, basically yeah. blew damp. <laughs> <laughs> damp, damp wind, yeah. wind your way, but it's still warm. But we rehearsed in Glenn Buxton's parents' garage, which he called the oven. <laughs> It'd be over 100 degrees in there. Oh, We'd yeah. be playing, rehearsing. <laughs> That's how you kept your trim figure, though, sweating it all out while writing these classics. <laughs> yeah, well, well, Alice and I also ran long distance on the track team and the cross-country team. So, you know, the heat didn't bother us. We would be out running... 20 miles and you know when it's really hot that's nuts so, amazing we would run toward a lake on the horizon in the desert and the lake wasn't real <laughs> right classic so i mean but you, so were you ch checking out other stuff i mean there's actually a jazz scene in arizona i mean mingus is from there i mean obviously he had left by by the mid 60s but did that ever cross over in your perception of what you're taking in no no the the uh, radio stations didn't play much jazz or blues it was it was all very bubblegummy uh, it's all very uh, am uh yeah. radio hits you know so there's a lot of beach boys and stuff like that and if you wanted to hear anything off the beaten path you had to go to a lot of trouble to try to find it 
what was big for us is the British invasion. It was like, right. you know, in 63, I saw Dwayne Eddy and the Rebels do a surprise performance between a double feature. And all of a sudden they came out, they came out and played four songs. And I said, that's what I want to do. And I told Alice, but it was, wasn't until the following year when the Beatles hit gigantic. I mean, they had the, the top 10 on AM radio was all Beatles at the time. That's how big it was. It was like somebody turned on yeah. the light and everything went to color instead of black and white. <laughs> So, all right. Yeah. Amazing. So of course, British invasion, which of course you sounded nothing like because you sounded nothing like anything that had happened before. When do you decide that's it? We got to get out of Phoenix. We got to go to Hollywood. Well, we had a friend, uh, Dick Christian, who was kind of like our guru. And he was the one that would travel six hours to get to LA. And he'd come back with all these stories. He's like, you guys got to move to LA. And we're like, why? We got to <laughs> number 11 hit single here and everywhere we play, you know, we play that song and people jump up and down. So he says, okay, well, do you want to remain big fish in a little pond or do you want to go and try to make it big time? We're like, okay. What year was that? That was 66. We started migrating. Okay. It's hard to believe that we did this, but that's how young we were. We all jumped in a van and drove to LA and we didn't have enough money between us to get a hotel room. So we slept in Griffith Park on the, on the park. Bench. Nice. Yeah. And in the morning, we're like, uh, well, we should go try to find some food. And we're walking down the hill. We're still in the park. And we come to this little parking lot. And there's a, a guy with a sandwich truck, you know, <laughs> sandwiches fresh daily. And he's standing there throwing out the previous day's sandwiches into the garbage bin. And we go up, you know, looking all uh, hungry, high. hungry. Yeah, skinny. And finally he goes, ah, oh, go ahead, just take them. And we moved in like locusts. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> all but, right so you're there night, you're, you're there and penniless and eating out of garbage cans fast forward that night we're walking down sunset boulevard and everything is happening i mean it's so packed that the cars it's a parking lot you know convertible corvettes with the babes in the back seat and but they're not going anywhere because the street is so packed with everything's going on the doors over here you know Jimi hendrix uh buffalo springfield everything and we're going oh okay we got to rethink uh what we're what we're doing here you know and and so little by little we kept going back to la and whenever we would run out of money, we'd go back to Phoenix and play and make a bunch of money and go back to, to L.A. again. And, you know, and, and we would dress crazy just walking down the street in broad daylight. We were dressed like we were on stage. You know, we met the GTOs that way. You know, they were walking down the street and we're like, hey, wait a minute. We like them. We like them. You know? Yeah. And uh, the and the GTOs were very supportive. I mean, uh Girls together outrageously. I that's, think that's right. Part of Frank Zappa's contingent, no? Well, Zappa signed him to his yeah. label at the same time he signed us. But at that time, they lived in his basement, <laughs> uh, his log cabin on Laurel Canyon Boulevard. So actually, Miss Christine and Alice became hand holding friends and <laughs> they looked alike too. They even <laughs> dressed alike and looked alike and would trade clothes once in a while. But we kept begging Christine, hey, tell Zappa to sign us to his label. He promised to come and see us three times. The first two times he didn't show up. The second time he showed up, but he had to leave before we played. So the fourth time, Alice and I are up there and Miss Christine was Moon Unit's babysitter. Okay. And, ba <laughs> and baby Moon was just a, she wasn't even walking yet. She was crawling. And so I would sort of be in charge of keeping Baby Moon from crawling into the fireplace or something while Alice put the charm on Miss Christine. And she said, oh, well, uh, Frank will be home tomorrow. We're like, we're coming over. She says, no, 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 he doesn't like people to come over. I'll tell you what, I'll ask him if it's okay for nine o'clock tomorrow and I'll call you if it's not okay. We're like, okay. So we go back, by the time we got back to our house in Topanga Canyon, which was about 23 miles away, we walked, you know, the cross country. Holy night. shit. Yeah. And and let's just talk about Topanga Canyon back in those days, because it was a kind of scary ramshackle 
hippie enclave where some of the Mansons hung out as well. Back back in the 60s, there were Manson buses hanging out looking for converts. Topanga was kind of like the more hippie, the more Buffalo yeah. Springfield, the dusty, tan, fringed leather jacket kind of stuff. Where Shit LA, shacks. Yeah, L.A. <laughs> was more the freaks, you know, Zappa and the hippie, <laughs> the, the doors yeah. and all that. But when we moved there, uh, Manson kind of happened just <laughs> after we were there, I think. But we were up at the top of the mountain and above us was a beatnik colony. You go up there, all right. you go to a party and everybody would be snapping their fingers and somebody would be telling scatting. a poem. Like, <laughs> scatting. They'd be telling a poem that every once in a while they'd scream the word death. <laughs> Everybody had to wear black, of course, right. uh, black turtlenecks. And Neil and I would go there, you know, and uh, think, okay, well, these guys are kind of living in the past, but there was still surfers. There was, <laughs> there was still uh, car guys from the fifties. LA had everything, you know, so it wasn't that they didn't stand out that much as being kind of out, sure. outdated. Well, LA was such a wild mix at that time too, in, in the mid to late sixties. I mean, it was such a wide you know, birth of so many kinds of music and so many things happening. It was happening every night in L.A. of all different kinds of dimensions of uh, from country to weirdos. Did you play with the Doors? Yeah, we actually got a job at this place called the Cheetah Lounge, which was the Avalon Ballroom, which was on a pier out over the ocean in Venice, California, Santa Monica. And right next to that was another pier, which was Pacific Ocean Park with the screaming people on the roller coasters and everything. But this gigantic ballroom was made famous by Lawrence Welk because he did his radio shows from there, which, okay. which made the, the Avalon famous and it also made Lawrence Welk famous. But now it had seen better days. And so they brought in all of these stainless steel sh sheets that surrounded it and they had this amazing psychedelic lighting rig and everything and and they had two stages side by side so when one band was setting up the other band was playing and we did our first show with the doors we did three shows in one day and backstage old school that we became friends that day because we were hanging out backstage for like the most of the day from noon until I don't know right. what, until one o'clock in the morning, hanging out with the doors and we became friends. Uh, how did you meet Shep Gordon? Uh, that was my wife. When we first met Zappa, like we, I started to tell you about going over to Zappa's house to audition. Well, we right. showed up at nine o'clock in the morning instead of nine o'clock at night. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Zappa was still asleep with his wife in their bedroom and we started playing. Anyway, oh. so Zappa said, I'll sign you, but I'm going to go on tour in three days. And, you know, you guys need to get a manager. And by then, Neil Smith's sister, Cindy, who is my wife, she wasn't my wife at that time, but uh, she had moved to L.A. to help Neil because he had told her how we didn't have any food and the band had just had a big accident in our truck and our equipment got smashed and everything. Uh, so she moved from Dallas to LA and got a job at the Inside Outside Boutique, which was a hip clothing shop. And uh, Joe Greenberg and Shep Gordon came in one day and she said, uh, you guys look like managers. And it was, <laughs> it, was, it was Cindy and her best friend, they're still best friends, Linda, so you had two blonde babes saying, you guys look like managers. So what did they say? Mm -hmm. They said, oh, yeah, we're managers. <laughs> they weren't managers. <laughs> not they, yet. Whoa. Not yet. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, but, but the fact that she told them that Frank Zappa wanted to sign us, but we needed managers also. And they're like, oh, OK, yeah, we're managers. Gears are turning. So then Cindy brought them up to Topanga and we played and they're like, well, I don't know about that. You know, they didn't know <laughs> uh, because the music, as you probably know, was pretty avant-garde. But we talked them into coming to the Cheetah Ballroom. There was a Lenny Bruce uh, tribute show. And there were all kinds of bands. Iron Butterfly out on the beach and, and the doors and us inside and all kinds of stuff. Anyway, so Frank Zappa was going to be there. So Joe and Shep said, yeah, we'll be there too. 
and the GTOs were all there front and center screaming for us and everything. They were great. The room was packed. I mean, this was a big ballroom. It was packed when we started playing. We were given it our freakiest, you know, for Zappa. <laughs> and Clear I, it out. <laughs> oh my God. Everybody, <laughs> yeah, people, mm -hmm. people were screaming insults while they were yeah. in the exit lines. And, wow. and we, how did I, how did I know, we, you we, know, you're good when they're right, when they're screaming for you to get off. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, we thought, Oh, you know, at one point I looked behind me thinking, is there a fire or something? You know, be, oh, right, yeah. right, right. But okay. Well, Zappa, I saw him leaving during our show and he was laughing uh, and then good sign. Joe, uh, Joe and Shep stayed and the GTO stayed. But afterwards, I thought, oh, my God, we blew it. OK, so we got off stage and Joe and Shep are like, hey, man, whatever you need, if you need, so if you need equipment, we'll get it. And Shep Gordon saying, you know what? You guys emptied this room in a matter of minutes there. You you've got something that but it needs to be harnessed. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so funny because, you know, cause I, cause I play a lot of avant-garde music, too, and it's always funny, the idea of, of playing a show that's the reverse of the Who General Admission Cincinnati disaster, where not everyone's running to the stage, but they're being trampled by running out of the fucking venue. All right. We've, like people are dying as they're trying to get out. Uh, well, we've all, we've all been there. Let's <laughs> well, uh, uh, Hey, look, Tim, why, why do you think Teenage Jesus sets were 10 minutes? I could still clear the house. That's all it took. <laughs> It's, let's face uh, let's face it it's a goal <laughs> but 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 it's, it's interesting because you know the props you're already setting up and, and even not to compare you to van halen but when i hear about people talking about the early van halen that david lee roth was setting up like he was already playing the carnival <laughs> slash uh, arena show in his mind and i guess it's just the ball I, I, was it balls or was it just like this is just who we are or and you did know, you did you have props at that point like you're doing and the first la shows or, or this uh ballroom thing did you have your stage props uh, then or not we, yeah we had props but they were very budget restricted we we didn't have any money so even though it was hollywood california we were five guys dressing in chrome outfits called alice cooper <laughs> that that's why they left that's why they left. Okay. They thought, okay. they thought, okay. oh man, okay. here's a bunch of transvestites, you know, and, <laughs> right. and I'm going to go outside and watch Buffalo Springfield, you know? <laughs> uh, I, I, I imagine if you would have had the forethought at that point to get a sponsorship from Home Depot. Uh, that yeah. Been well, good. <laughs> I, well, I wanted to get a sponsorship from Budweiser, but nobody would touch us with a 10 foot pole. They the thought you'd, you'd drink them out of profits. <laughs> and we we would have given them a run for their money. <laughs> Speaking of drinking, I, I mean, I know there's heavy drinking in this band early on, at least, or maybe not with you, but with Alice Cooper. And and what was the general environment? You're hanging out with the doors. It seems like it's a pretty insane. And then, of course, L.A. at the time seems like it's a pretty insane party environment. Of course, I always heard that Zappa was not he was fairly sober. I actually I don't really know, but I've heard those rumors. Uh, how, how did that counterculture drug drinking world mix with the professional world that you guys actually yeah did you did you dive right into the drugs and drink pot was on our scene and and there were other influences depending on what groupie somebody went home with or whatever you know but generally la at the time was the valley of the dolls and we would right we would go to parties where everybody was passed out on the floor and a lot of bands went down because of that a lot yeah. of bands migrated to la and got caught up in that scene and never made it, you know? Got glued, they got glued to the floor. By those standards, we were pretty, we rehearsed all the time, you know? We, right. we spent all day rehearsing. And then we'd go and we'd walk down to the bottom of the hill in Topanga and buy a jug of uh, Mountain Red or whatever, you know, Glenn used to say it, never saw a grape. You know, a giant, a giant jug of burgundy wine, you know, and, oh, wow. uh, you know, and stuff like that. But uh, also your songs were a lot more complicated than a lot of other music that was going down. I mean, the Doors didn't really have complicated music. It was about as basic and simple as you get. And the, the main thing was just uh, Morrison's charisma and sex appeal. But I mean, you were already developing some pretty complex material. So you better frickin rehearse. Uh, because we had so many tempo changes. Even, yeah. Zappa, even Zappa said that when we woke him up in the morning. <laughs> he said, 
you guys do tempo changes that, that I wish I could get the mothers of invention to do. Yeah, uh, because it, it was and, a card. It was natural. Yeah, but at the time, I thought, you got to be kidding me. The mothers can play anything, and they could, you know. Well, well, that's the, the, the thing is tempo changes are different, are, are much harder than time changes because you're you kind of have to memorize or just internalize those different tempos. Exactly. And, I mean, that's true. And, and that's kind of it's you know, when I hear like say even like death metal now or just or heavy metal it, all the tempo changes it, it's like folk art. It's like wait, how are they even doing this? It's it, it, they but they have it internalized. So yeah, yeah really cool point. Yeah, really cool that's point. what it boils down to. I mean, we're not the. I mean, classic. Classical music has things like that. So, oh, it does, but usually it's 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 conduct historically conducted. Uh, again, time changes relative, but tempo changes is that's something else without a conductor to internalize it. That's badass. The unfortunate part of it is that we worked really hard to be able to do those tempo changes, and I don't think anybody in the audience liked them. <laughs> no. Well, you can't. It's hard to, for them to dance at that point. Uh, no, I mean, nobody was. Da- yeah. The, Actually, oh, uh, Dennis, I was dancing around my TV on a Friday midnight, midnight special, Don Kirshner, whatever I first saw Ellis Cooper on. I was dancing around like a dwarf freak. Loving it. Hey, you know, uh, we did uh, to backtrack going back to the uh, spiders when we had the hit in Tucson, Arizona. We went down there and we got a gig in a coffee house uh, near the, the university. And it was just a little tiny place that normally had a folk guitar player, you know, and then sell coffee, right? That and with a little bit of the beatnik thing going, right? <laughs> and so we got a gig there, and the guy we said, okay, well, you have to have a stage. And he says, I have a stage. So we went down there. He had nailed a a piece of plywood to the bar. That was the stage. We had to all stand up there <laughs> on, oh on a piece of plywood, and we're playing. And all of these uh, college students were there. And then all of a sudden, the door kicks open and in marches a a bunch of guys dressed up like Nazis in uniforms and marching and and the whole stomping. And and they came in and people evacuated so that these guys could take over the place. It was just a little tiny place, too. But so we're playing to Nazis. And there's one there's one girl that's dancing in front of the P.A., and she's dancing really beautifully and everything. And she didn't leave. But finally, the Nazis, uh, you know, stood at attention and, <laughs> and, and marched out. And then people started coming back in. Anyway, after that, Alice and I are sitting over at a table. And we got paid in coffee. So we were wired. <laughs> we, were, oh, wow. we were wired, you know. And so we're sitting there going, oh, my God, you know, I can't believe that. What are we going to tell people? You know, oh, yeah, well, we played to a bunch of Nazis and... <laughs> And, and one dancer. Okay, now the girl sends a note over to us that says, I, I love the vibes of your music. And so we said, oh, the vibes, that's interesting. And the guy that gave us a note said, well, well, she's deaf. She's, play, she's, play, <laughs> she's play, playing to the vibrations of your music. You were like the human cool. theremin. Dennis, my would-be friend. Well, now you're my Zoom friend. You yeah. wrote... <laughs> Some of the best songs for Alice Cooper. I'm just going to name a few. I'm sure there might be more. Let me know if I'm missing any. First of all, I'm 18 and you still do it with Blue Coop. Thank you very much. School's out. Under my wheels. Is it my body? Just a few weeks ago, I had to hear, is it my body? I was desperate. <laughs> um, elected Billion Dollar Babies, one of my favorite albums, as well as School's Out. Be My Lover, Caught in a Dream, Black. <laughs> Juju, killer, generation landslide. What I wanted to ask you is Bob Ezrin came into the picture, I think on your third album, Love It to Death. Yeah. And and Bob Ezrin is just, I don't know if they make producers like that any anymore. I mean, and what do you know as a producer when you're a young kid, you're listening to these records, but I was looking at Bob Ezrin's name. Also, he produced Berlin, one of my favorite albums by Lou Reed. What did he add to the, to the mix and how did he even come into the picture? as a producer for, for these, for the next five albums. We had built a reputation, you know, we had, we kind of had the validation of Frank Zappa. We had toured with the Mothers of Invention, uh, which was quite an education. Uh, <laughs> we had, we had the chick, chicken incident. We had all kinds of 
press for the notoriety of our shows. But, you know, even the mothers of invention could only make a certain amount of money because the right. promoters were so chart driven. Uh, and and you they know, were so weird. I mean, speak about weird. That's about as weird as you get is, is Frank Zappa. So, yeah, yeah. But the irony, the sad irony is that they could pack anywhere they played, but they could only get paid a certain amount because oh, they, weird. Didn't have, they didn't have a hit single. Uh, OK, that's what we needed. We needed a hit single. So driving around the Midwest and we were in the Detroit scene, you know, by then the Stooges, MC5, Nugent and all the all the Motor City bands accepted us into the fold, you know, and we were playing a lot, a lot of festivals and everything. But while we were driving around, especially in the Midwest, radio was great there. You know, it seems like if you were in other states, other parts of the country, you would keep changing the the pushing the buttons on the radio to try to find a song that you wanted to listen to. Well, when you got into the Midwest, every time a song would come on, you'd turn it up a little bit. And then Wait, what year are you talking about now? I'm talking about 68, 69, right. 70. There was actually a lot of radical top 10 hits and, and, and AM somehow music at that point that was very diverse. I mean, from Ball of Confusion to even Light My Fire. I mean, the range was so wide. Oh, absolutely. Text. It was such a great time for, for music that somehow you, you could hear on the radio. Right, but at that time, we're all in the station wagon together <laughs> all right. most of the time. And, and the little dashboard speaker, uh, we thought the guess who at that time, you know, American Woman, these eyes and those songs we thought jumped right out of the speaker. We said, we need a, a producer like that guy. We need and that. A, American woman is a great song. Yeah. <laughs> it's the, a great song. But, but if you listen to the single on a little speaker, it, it, <laughs> it is, uh, it's produced in your face. Right? It slides, so it slides said, okay, through the environment. That's yeah. what we need. Joe and Shep started hounding Jack Richardson, who was up in Toronto. Wherever he went, there would be messages from Alice Cooper. You know, hey, come and listen to the band. They were brutal. Every he he would go to the hotel and there'd be messages. He'd go to the you know recording studio and there'd be messages. So he wanted it to stop. So this guy that worked with him, Bob Essern had never produced anything, but he said, okay, you know, John Shep kind of talked him into it too. We'll we'll fly you to New York to hear the band, okay. And Jack Richardson's like, yeah, go. And then we can t let them down easy and get rid of them, you know? You were stalking them. You, you stalked your first producer by proxy. <laughs> That's right. Well, we stalked there. We, well, we sp stalked our first producer, Frank Zappa, too. Don't forget. <laughs> yeah. Let's go back. He, stalked, he did stalk him. <laughs> well, you, must, you, you guys must have been pretty charming because, because the hard sale, the hard soliciting, usually doesn't work for most people, but somehow you guys consistently pulled it off. Well, I think well, in both both samples, they just wanted to like get it over with. And then they realized, hey, there's yeah. something here. <laughs> I, I think he just wanted to get rid of us. But <laughs> now we're going into some territory that you know about. Max is Kansas City. Oh, yeah. New York City had not been kind to us. We were getting pretty big everywhere, except every time we played in New York, everybody just had their arms crossed and what year, what year was that? <laughs> what, what, well, that, that was the New York crowd. Uh, what year was that? 72, well, 69, 69. Early. Yeah. Yeah. 69. And then, so we played Max's Kansas City and Bob Ezrin was in the audience, you know, and he came up to us afterwards and said, oh man, you guys are doing something that's, this is going to be the next big thing. The only thing is I've listened to your records and that's not what I'm getting from your records. We've got to get what you do on the excitement you do on stage into the grooves, right? So now Bob Ezrin goes back up to Canada and goes up. He describes it like, you know, because Bob Ezrin at the time, he, well, he's still, he looks younger than he is. He looked like a kid, right? Don't so, we all? So now he's, he's describing that he's looking up over the edge of uh, Jack Richardson's desk and saying, Jack, guess what? I like him. So Jack, he went back to Warner Brothers, but Warner Brothers said, well, he's never produced anything. Okay, we'll sign you, but only if Jack Richardson is the executive producer to oversee the first two records, which was Love It to Death and Killer, 
at because Jack had a reputation for doing albums under budget and getting a hit single. Ah, so, cover so cover their ass. Okay, what, okay. <laughs> yeah. Now, so Bob Ezrin came to Pontiac. By then, we had gotten a farm outside of Detroit in Pontiac, Michigan. And we could play as loud as we wanted, as late as we wanted. And so we were rehearsing like quite often 10 hours a day. Wow. And when we weren't in the rehearsal room, we'd go up to the house and sit down with acoustic guitars or, or write lyrics and stuff. It was 24 seven, all we, me in particular, I was very quiet. I didn't talk to people much. All I did is think about what the band could do to make it, right? You talk a lot about this too in your book that came out. What was the title? Gu guillotines. Snakes, guillotines, electric chairs. Yeah, you, you, <laughs> that's, I, I read that when I was uh, nomading at our friend Andy Schoenhoff's house. Set my oh, yeah. regards. Good old Andy, and, uh, another bass player. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Uh, so what did Bob Ezrin bring to the mix? Because I mean, from those, first of all, this, those were peak Alice records. And to me, it did, it did end at Billion Dollar Babies. But Bob Ezrin produced the next five, five, five records, four records. And they were, the they were the classics and there were hits. You wrote some hits. Yeah. And that's exactly what he did. You know, when he saw us at Max's, he said, I love that song, I'm Edgy. Ah. But, but it was I'm 18. He just misunderstood. That's the funny. Room. So he showed up at the Pontiac Farm. And of course, the, <laughs> the legend goes, he showed up late at night from the airport and the room was darkened and everybody was kind of in their own rooms with their, you know, girlfriends or whatever. Crashed, crashing out. And, and, and <laughs> I, I had decided that I was going to be a frog. I had this frog mask that covered my whole head and I had all green. I had green, a green shirt on. And you had I a just, green base then too, right? It was that the Gibson <laughs> that you had, the uh, one with the... Uh, the Gibson with a P -ba P base pickup, so you added to it. Was that part right? Of the same? And it was called the Frog because Cindy <laughs> Cindy thought I I looked like a frog when I smiled. So so now I did that night I decided I was going to be a frog and only say ribbit and, until Cindy kissed me and then I would turn into her prince. Right? Aww. <laughs> no, Bob Bob Ezrin came in the living room and it's kind of dark in there and there's like a, a monkey in a cage and all this crazy decoration and stuff. And there's a frog there and he's a says, human oh, frog. <laughs> yeah. Well, he says, hello, Mr. Frog. And I said, ribbit. <laughs> so the anyway, the next day, <laughs> the first thing we did when we got down to brass tacks, we discussed it over breakfast and Ezra and said what I said before, you know, Hey, we got to get your stage show onto record so that when people listen to your record, they get an idea of what, yeah. what to expect, okay? Mm -hmm. And so we went down to the rehearsal room and he said, let's start with I'm Edgy. And that's when we said, well, it's called I'm 18. <laughs> and that's the first song we did because we had a long sprawling organ intro, bluesy, and then it would kick in and then it would, you know, so I don't know, it was probably a five minute song or something, but to get on to AM radio. Three minutes and 30 seconds maximum. <laughs> you, got, you got it. And in, in, and within a, within about three hours, Bob Ezrin had whittled it down to three minutes. Amazing. And it became the most requested song. Oh God, yes. CKLW. <laughs> do you own the rights to this i mean you're a co-writer yeah how did that all go down did it go down in your favor or do you do you still have uh publishing on that song we never had publishing chip gordon had publishing and then there was a lawsuit with frank zappa's manager and they ended up settling frank zappa's manager ended up getting way more than he deserved in our right. opinion <laughs> right but, I, but we never had publishing on on those uh songs uh, no. uh, uh well, wait wait eventually you did though i hope no no not really oh you're yeah okay this is where you and i differ a bit dennis F somehow instinctively from the age of 17 i'm like i own every fucking thing and i still do no oh, i never had a hit single but we can talk about that later i got some ideas for you my so, friend <laughs> so L lydia lydia <laughs> i i would assume you're a bob dylan fan oh uh, well <laughs> To in, that, in that respect, because he was a, he was a the guy that did that. 
everything, all publishing, everything, you know, belonged to him. Well, well the thing that, is, who knew in those days, everybody is, was being so ripped off. I mean, musicians are have, have consistently been ripped off left, right, and center. And for some reason, even though I was doing some of the most uncommercial music ever, I'm like, I'm going to own it. Who else wanted it? Well, we were one of the few bands that were able to have our manager own our publishing because most record companies wouldn't sign a group unless they got the publishing. Yeah. Right. Oh. right, right. So it was kind of like from the get go, from our understanding, that it wasn't even up for grabs for the, you know, the Beatles never owned their publishing. So until, sick. until later, they, they, they bought, well, they tried. And then Michael Jackson ended up buying, well, anyhow, the whole thing. Also, I mean, look, you're doing what you do. Yeah, you would like a hit single because you heard some cool things on the Midwestern radio at that time. But who frickin' knew that you might churn out as many as you did? Well, you know, they used to say getting a hit single is almost impossible. Getting a second hit single is even harder. If you get a third one, you are established. So we thought, okay, I'm 18. Now, we all went to high school together, you know, so whenever... To, to this day, when we get together, we're all in high school again. You know? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> so we were thinking, okay, what is going to make a hit single? Number one, we asked the record company guy, okay, who's who buys records? Yeah. <laughs> and they said, they said, 18 years old, because you're still living at home, you probably have a job so you can afford to buy your own records without your parents uh, dictating. And uh, so we said, okay, we're going to write a single for that person, right? That's and funny. that that worked. Now, on the Killer, you know, we kind of lost a little bit of our uh, focus of that. But then we got it back on Schools Out. Because, right. well, well, but, yeah. but Killer, I mean, again, this is such a weird, wonderful, theatrical, frightening concept rock, which is definitely what drew me and no doubt countless other weirdos into it because there was just nothing like that. And, you know, there was concept rock was starting around that time. There were other people doing it, of course, but I mean, even things like Ballad of Dwight, try uh, Ballad of Dwight Fryer. I'm a killer. I, these songs were just so monumental for my future forensic file <laughs> existence. Well, they were designed as platforms for Alice to develop the dark character, you know, and everything we did started going toward that goal. You know, we had rock songs and we had still some avant-garde kind of stuff, but, but we knew if we got a, a single, then people would listen to the other stuff. Because and these records came out pretty rapidly. I mean, they came out every year you were releasing a record at that point. Uh, we were doing two records a year, but that was... You know, the Beatles set the bar high back then. And, and that's also why certain songs never became a hit. Because after you put out a couple of singles, then you didn't want to put out another one because you wanted to save that for the single on the next, next album. album yeah. Already out. So the thing about Killer that was different than Love It to Death is that we could afford equipment. We could afford new strings. We could afford to feel our oats and feel success because we had done some some uh, very successful shows because of I'm 18. But well, also, I think that's why it's great if people read your book so they can understand. People think, oh my God, a big big rock band, you know, big from almost the get-go, you're releasing records, but you're touring in a damn station wagon to a point. People don't really realize that people can know who you are, but you're still scraping to get by. You still, have, you got to put the time on the road, sometimes in Lydia, a station wagon. Lydia had to do with our image. You know, if we, if we uh, had this. I understand. We, if we had a, a hit single, if 18 was a band that looked like, yeah, you know, I, <laughs> I, I preach into the choir. I know. Uh, but. And you know Tish and Snooky, of course. You know why I'm they... so happy you're <laughs> they're still performing with you. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. And you know why they stuck to their guns and, and had hard. I, they're not forever. called the sick fucks for nothing, honey. I'm just uh, saying. Yeah, I know they tried calling themselves the sick folks, but that just ain't doesn't gonna work. work. Hey, uh, how did you get involved with Diary of a Mad Housewife? A great film, and there is a freaky scene with Alice Cooper band. How did that come about? What year was that? Like seventy three? What year was that? Do you know? No, that was that was sixty nine or wow, 70. wow. Yeah. 
69 or 70, I can't remember exactly, okay. but Richard Perry, the director and his wife, Eleanor, you know, the movie didn't have any music in it, but he wanted to have a scene that looked like the hippest uh, <laughs> underground New York City scene, right? And so he hired us, I guess, because we had just done the chicken thing and had the reputation, you know, he hired us, but he had already paid Mars Bonfire to do the music. So we had to listen to a 12 inch album with Mars Bonfire singles. And the only one that we liked was Born to be Wild, but that was already done. So we didn't mm -hmm. want to do that. So we did our second favorite, which was Ride With Me, which Steppenwolf finally did. Okay, so we start playing that song. And once we get past the recommended amount of that, we went into this just total avant-garde sound collage freak out thing. <laughs> Frank Perry didn't, it was all one take and yeah. nobody knew that we were gonna do that. The, all, all Frank Perry knew is that we wanted 50 feather pillows and we wanted some Wesson oil for Alice to pour on the crowd so the feathers would stick. Oh. And and that's all he knew. That's all. And he knew that we dressed crazy and had this crazy reputation. So now we have a room full of extras and we're all on stage. He says, OK, folks, this is going to be one take only. Fasten your seat belts. Here we go. <laughs> and we start and it's relatively, you know, it's like uh, we're playing the song. And so he's that's what he expected. And then when everything all hell broke loose, it went crazy. There was so many feathers at one point that you couldn't see. It was just pure white in the room. And and by the time we got done, the feathers were knee deep. On oh, my oh, my God. They didn't realize that Alice was really the mad housewife. I think they were pleased. I think they got more than what they wanted. But the problem, I, I've always uh, <laughs> been disappointed that we couldn't get the footage of that because the just the footage of us playing was my favorite footage I think I've ever seen of us performing. And they had to cut it down and use just little bits of it to fit the, the yeah. story. We watched the rushes and thought, oh man, this is gonna be unbelievable. And then we see the film and we go, hey, what happened, you know? <laughs> Nippity doo dah, <laughs> snippity day. What's your favorite album that you did with the, well, in Alice, up to Billion Dollar Babies? What was, was there a favorite album you have? I mean, they're all pretty unique. There is, a, it seems like there is a trajectory running through them, but they're, they're all, I mean, and Billion Dollar Babies is definitely quite unique. And to me, it is the cutting off point. What do you think is your favorite? Well, well I always say uh, my heart is with Pretties For You because right. I love, you know, that's a statement that nobody, even us, couldn't ever make again. I think Killer was our strongest across the board because we were all, all uh, cylinders were firing and, and the band was still in charge of uh, pretty much everything we wanted to do. That, therefore, the decisions were made on artistic reasons yeah as opposed to later it started becoming more and more on financial reasons you're getting more pressure i mean that you know and then you know you're having the hits you're getting more pressure i mean what about the size of the audiences once it starts like really becoming you start getting these hits i mean how drastically does this change i mean are you suddenly like what size you know when when the when the hit singles are coming out what size audiences are you suddenly playing in front of well, we did a lot of festivals in those days. So we were used to playing the big crowds. But, on, on a typical but, tour when you're just doing your own headlining clubs or, or arenas, I don't know what you're playing, but what, what was that looking like? Well, we still had to fill in the gaps. So yeah. if we if we had a, bi a big show in Boston and a big show, you know, in Florida, then we might pick up a club in Philly. To, right. So it kind of would keep uh, things going. But another good management thing, you know, uh, Joe Greenberg and Shep Gordon were amazing. They were just as creative at managing the huh. band as we were with the music. Okay. You know, and everybody was specialized. That's what they did. This is what we did. And we coordinated it. But uh, we, we got offers to go into arenas before and would refuse them because, okay. because we would rather have a bunch of people outside of a, yeah. of a movie theater uh, size venue than to play an arena prematurely and have yeah. empty seats. Empty seats. Back, 
empty seats was was the kiss of death. Back Plus, then. the overhead is greater. Right? You, you know, you're taking a bigger financial risk, I would assume. Yeah, well, also by holding out, we could uh, have more clout to get more money for when we did finally do that. Plus, right. if there's one thing that people should be able to do back in those days was to smell the group and to taste <laughs> the madness, because it is a very intimate expression of avant madness on a surrealistic level. And I think an arena yeah, whatever. But I do think the more intimate shows, which could be up to X amount of people, people need people want to be up close and rubbing against it. All right. There might not be Western oil. There might not be any feathers. They need to smell it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> some, of my, some of my favorite gigs was in the early days when people expected a female folk singer. Right. Oh, and, OK. And, and we would come in, we'd show up and the promoter would be going, Oh no, no, no. <laughs> Let's this. Where's the where's the female folk singer? Like, oh no, we'll tone it down. We promise. You know, and and we do our full show in a tiny room, feathers and everything. <laughs> I, I I love that. But my favorite uh size of room is those old movie theaters. A lot of yeah. them uh, unfortunately the East Town and Grandy Ballroom in Detroit are dilapidated now, but but for a while, they were saved from becoming parking lots because of rock. And, and those were my favorite because you got the full impact of the lighting. The, you controlled the, the, the PA. You could see the person in the back row. And everybody got the full impact. And smaller rooms, too. You know, I, 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 no, I agree. Like theaters, movie theaters, it, it just it puts everything in a slightly different realm. And especially when it is something theatrical, I think it's a very, I mean, I myself prefer exactly those kind of venues. I, I want to look everyone in the eye. Of course, my audience might be a lot smaller than yours, but put it in a movie house, put it in a theater, let them smell the madness. <laughs> the last show I did before uh, this whole COVID shutdown was Phoenix, Arizona. The, and it was a, a stage in the round in the middle of an intimate room. Nice. And, and Johnny Depp and Joe Bonamassa sat in with us. But we were right in the middle of the crowd. And... And that's when it, you're talking about overkill on the impact because because it was you know you could really see everybody in the room. And All right. uh, was that was that Dennis Dunaway? Or was that Blue Coop? What was that? What was that? That, that was uh, the original Alice Cooper group uh, doing a benefit for Alice and Cheryl's foundation out in Phoenix, the Solid Rock Foundation, which is a great thing for kids to learn the arts. Uh, Art, dance, music, production, how to play. Uh, it's a great So thing. important, especially as schools get dumber and teach less and cut out art programs. It's art so art is always the first to go. Art, oh, yeah. art, uh, art's the first to go. And people don't realize how important that is. Well, I and mean, also how music, art, movies, literature, they definitely saved my life as a youngster. Yeah, and... And that's something that, you know, when I go out and meet fans, it's a reoccurring thing. People like, you know, well, I, I would have been lost in high school, except I had my I had my favorite bands and and, you know, and that that pulls you through. And that's a great thing about music, whether you're sad, you're happy or whatever. There's a there's a song for it. Well, and also, I mean, I want to say it, it, what's interesting to me is especially a lot of the really heavy, insane darkness of the early Ellis Cooper material. It didn't promote people to go out and be psycho. It actually calmed them down because somebody else was in the same state or could understand that condition of thought. They could understand I'm a killer. They could understand, is it my body? I'm 18, school's out. And I think, you know, it, that it just actually relieved a lot of people of some of the frustration, the darkness, the anger they also had and put it in such a theatrically insane and sometimes comedic presentation. It was so important, so important to people in my generation. I know that. So now we've got Blue Coop. Yeah. Uh, Joe and Albert Bouchard, the Bouchard brothers from Blue Oyster Cult fame. So we met in 1972. Uh, Alice Cooper had just become a headliner 
Dr. John was opening for us. And then about- Oh, I love Dr. John. Yeah, opening we, for Alice Cooper. We, oh, wait a second, wait a second. Is it true that you opened for Ike and Tina Turner one time? Uh, you know, that was at the uh, Fillmore West. We didn't open for them. They We had to follow them. Oh, we I saw to- I saw a poster of this in Italy a few years ago, and I'm like, oh my, what? Ike and Tina Turner and Alice Cooper? How bizarre and how wonderful. Oh my God. I was in the audience and I fell in love with one of the iCats. And I thought, <laughs> I thought, oh my God, I do not want to follow this act. Right. I'd, I'd rather crawl under a rock and die, you know? So, so powerful, the iCats and Tina Turner. We, well, we, even earlier than that, way back in our first early LA days, we had to follow Aretha Franklin. Okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> What could yeah. you not? Could you not protest? Could you say like, "Well, <laughs> we want to go first. What was that all about? You, I guess yeah. you had more fans. Or... <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just we managed to get the gig. You know, and... I can't even wrap my legs, not to mention my head around that one, honey. I just yeah, can't. Do well, it. I can. I can. Gene <laughs> Turner killed it. Of course, Aretha killed it, and. You know, and we would be backstage going, oh, my God, whose idea was this? You know, and I'd say, <laughs> well, well, look at it this way. From now on, we can say that they opened for us. <laughs> I don't care who plays first, second or third, but that is a bill one would kill to say. Yeah, to yeah, but, you know, but, you know, and, you know, Bill Graham didn't like us. He thought we ruined everything. And he did that on purpose. He said he swore that we would never headline the uh, Fillmore. And so all of the posters, every time we ever played the Fillmore East or West, our name is the smallest at the bottom. And that's why it looks like we opened for them. But we were. Well, you had the biggest impact and you got the smallest letter set. No biggie. Well, you know, they had the they had the legs and the dance moves and the singing and everything. But but we'd come out and throw a chicken at the audience and there'd be no comparison, you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's, cause we've only got a few minutes left on this. So bring us up to date. So, and by the way, as I was saying before we, we started recording, it's amazing to me because when I was checking out your uh, recent concert just a few years ago of Blue Coop, yourself and some yeah. of the members of Blue Ways are called, I was like, I covered Black Juju for a decade and I covered Don't Fear the Reaper many, many decades ago <laughs> with Jim Thurwell, Clint Rowan. And I love cover songs. And those are two of my favorites, I have to say. <laughs> it's a good job done with Blue Coop. You know, uh, Don't Fear the Reaper is just one of those magical, magical songs. As soon as the riff starts, uh, it, it grabs you and it works every time, no matter what. Every mm-hmm. time acoustic guitar, you could play it on, probably play it on a kazoo and it'll work. <laughs> it grabs you. It grabs you. <laughs> it grabs you. And so we've got that. We've got the uh, all the other Blue Oyster Cult catalog and the Alice Cooper catalog. And we have three albums now. So so we just released our third album right when the uh, CD baby shut down and everything. But we're going to give put new wind in our sails because 11 even is the name of it because blue coop were together for 11 years okay uh the album has 10 songs but if you wait 11 seconds there's (laughs) an 11th song nice and that'll the 11th song is called jump the gun and it's about an egotistical singer in a band and this innocent looking groupie makes her way backstage and turns out to not be so innocent and he jumped the gun and so we are we are now making a fully animated uh, video for that, which will be out in a, a couple of months. And uh, Blue Coop, you know, Joe and Albert are fun to play with. Uh, we we we've been down in the trenches. We played every size room. We even played. Get this. We played Jamba Juice in Times Square. Oh, my. Yeah. I, I want I want to go back one second, because you mentioned a few times and people only of my generation are older what know that when you say groupie it has a different meaning mm-hmm. coming from us of our generation because groupies back in the late 60s early 70s uh they were just hot cool gals that want to get down with the band it was all right. There was no problem with that it was women doing what they wanted to do and who doesn't want to fuck a goddamn rock star let me tell you i know all about it 
It had a very different connotation and meaning. Right. Well, there were also the innocent groupies too, but there, you're right. There was a status to it. You know, you're a groupie. So, you know, watch uh, yeah, Almost kind, Famous. Come on. Groupies were, kind of, famous. <laughs> groupies were kind of rock stars. Yeah. Uh, and some of them still are. Getting back to Dr. John, Dr. John started using the snake three shows in and we'd say, you can't use a snake. So now we're looking for an opening <laughs> band and we're at an outside festival in North Carolina, beautiful day and BOC start playing. And Alice and Neil and I were walking around in the crowd and I said, let's get them. And, <laughs> and, we've, and we've been friends ever since 1972. You know, we toured a lot back then. Then they went on to headline. I saw them at uh, Madison Square Garden. And so, you know, all of the stories, it, it's never ending. It's just it's amazing. Uh, listening to the Bouchard brothers talk about Blue Oyster Cult. It's in stereo, right? And, and I, I knew Helen Wheels back in the day who, who used to write some material yes. with Blue Oyster Cult. I, right. I, I knew them. Also, I saw your and I, I, I saw your cold, cold coffin video, which oh, is great. quite beautiful. It is like a mini horror film, really beautifully shot. Congratulations. Oh, on that you. i thought that was really cool and that's just under dennis dunaway correct that was great uh yes uh at, that was just a song that i had written for alice and then they didn't feel that it fit into the album or actually i think i may have sent it to him after they had already decided what songs were going to be on paranormal and so um uh, they used some other songs that i did but not that one and anyway so i played it for a friend peter perenni which is tish's husband yeah and he's That's Tisha film. Snooky of the Sick Fox Manic Panic. They've been around a long time. Yeah, and they've done everything. But yeah. uh, but anyway, so Peter listens to the song and said, we got to make a film. And I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. So we got together. His son worked on it. We got Filmed in that beautiful Highland Castle. I didn't even know that that existed. That place is so gorgeous where you shot it. It is. It's unbelievable. And uh, therefore, the budget was pretty expensive because of that castle. But we had to have the castle. I had to have the yeah. castle. <laughs> and so we're, we're looking, we're calling up uh, New York City dancers thinking we need a dancer because we wanted to have a dance scene around a glass coffin. And uh, then I'm like, wait a minute. You know, Cheryl Cooper is out on the road, but, but Calico, their daughter, she's a dancer. So we arranged, uh -huh. and Calico Cooper stars in it with me. She's the young gold digging wife, and I'm the old <laughs> eccentric guy. Amazing. And then your daughters also are very creative, jewelry they designer, are, yes. music, comedy sketches. So, I mean, the whole Alice Cooper family, you're still married to Cindy, who's Neil Smith's sister, who did the costumes for Alice Cooper. I mean, this is just like, the, uh, the it is the real Adams family, in a sense, that just keeps going. Dennis Dunaway, some of the best songs ever written having to do with hard rock weirdness, avant-garde is, am I'm 18, school's out under my wheels, is it my body, I have to hear that, elected, mm -hmm. I wish I was, I should be, be my lover, you wish you were, caught in a dream, that's what you do when you masturbate to me, black <laughs> juju is in my blood, I'm a motherfucking killer, what can I say, Dennis Dunaway. Started a long time ago is going into the future. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm glad I finally got a chance to talk to you, Lydia. I, I can't wait. I might. Hey, COVID's almost over. I might be taking the, the Amtrak up to see you one day. I need to see you. It's <laughs> been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you.